It's an incredible honor to be here to celebrate the achievement of peace in this country. 25 years ago in Paris, they signed the, the accords to, to gain peace. And for my sins and my work brought me back out here. I'd been here in the 60s. I came to Anchor uh, in 1964 and I came cross border with illegally without a visa with American special forces and other sundry clandestine units. This is back in during the Vietnam War. And then I came back in 1990 for the first time looking for, as you well know, 17 journalists went MIA on the road to Vietnam near Svai Riang. And amongst them was very, my brother, my mate, my closest friend, Sean Flynn, Earl Flynn's son. And it drew me back into this country. And in 1991, I came here on assignment for The Guardian and Newsweek, um, AP and a number of other people. And <clears throat> at that time was when the first UN general came back in and the first presence for the, the, the attempt at peace. I start with an image which is a total mistake. I am maybe a better writer, as my publisher says, than I am a photographer. And I was farting about with my camera, my new camera, back in, this is in 1992, up at the airport here. And the Khmer Rouge had mortared the place, and the French were filling up their sandbags. And then I went to where they were rebuilding a what on the back roads of the airport, where they're now storing the bones from the, uh, the Khmer Rouge massacre. And for about half a roll of film, I dutifully wound back everything and made these double exposures. I'm not that good in a technical sense. In fact, I'm Jurassic Park when it comes to digital. And this is, was about to go in the bin, and it got saved. And I sent it to Sasha, and she's now using it as the, the poster for the whole process of this peace process. We'll go back to 1991. And part of the process of gaining peace was to invite all the various parties, the Khmer Rouge, the Royalists, the Neutralists, the, the Wackos. I mean, there was a mass of, I mean, not a mass, there was five warring or parties maneuvering to get into power. And when they brought Q Sam Pan, who was brother number two, back into the country, he arrived at Pochin Tong and there was a convoy heavily guarded to downtown. And they assigned him a villa right in the center of Phnom Penh. And instantly there was a massive crowd who wanted to kill him. End of story. They just wanted they wanted they wanted to string him up. And they assaulted the villa. And the next thing you knew, there was Khmer Rouge code papers, $100 bills, computers being burnt, and a, in total insanity. But a lot of it was fueled by the CPP. And the idea of it was, was to somehow create an Antigone against the Khmer Rouge, which I can't blame them for. And this dude, three times the police took his hatchet away and gave it back to him. He was, and he's just an argent provocateur trying to get into the villa to kill Q Sampan. Probably the most successful thing in terms of a logistic exercise, as you all know, there was hundreds of thousands of Khmer had, had moved to Thailand, some to Vietnam and some to Laos. And they were on the border in Khao Dung, uh, Koh Samet, Koh Kong. I mean, there was a number of camps along the border, which I did stories on in the late 70s and the early 80s. They brought them back across the border in buses, stuck them on the few trains that were remaining, and then moved them down to Phnom Penh to redistribute them back to their home villages. And this was the first train to arrive back in, in, on the outskirts of Phnom Penh in, in 92. I don't know who put the flag on the side of the train. It wasn't me. The trains were still, as I said, were just running. This is a train leaving for early in the morning for, for Sihanoukville and Kampot at, at Phnom Penh Station. Just before this, and right through the first part of the peace period, 
there were still enormous problems in this part of Cambodia and the West. There was a massive shortage of food, I mean, incredible shortage of food. There was virtual starvation. And they were still coming across the border into Thailand to come back with rice sacks, I mean, with, on buffalo carts and on their heads. And this is, I mean, you can see this, this is a place called Nong, Nong Chan, which was a Khmer Rouge run refugee camp. And people came back from Vietnam, this is at the Nik Long ferry where there was still a necessity to, I mean, you can see the guy with an RPD, some uh, light machine gun in the truck. And this is at the Nik Long ferry, which is where the bridge is now across the Mekong River. This is one of the crossing points into Thailand, this is CT4, which is oh, south of, south of uh, Poi Pet, I mean, further towards the, the coast, where there was no border controls. I mean, you could, as you see, you could drive round the border post without, I mean, the immigration didn't exactly need a visa at this point. This was shot with an American spook who was taking us round in his personal Russian helicopter. This is the crossing point at CV2, which was the crossing point into Vietnam. They opened up all the borders with, I think there were 10 on the Vietnamese side, nine on the Thai side, and two on the Laos, on the top of the country in Laos. Again, the control was marginal. This was the first UN general to come back in who was mobbed at Pochentong by the media, a guy called Loridon. He had been a bit of a, like, a, he'd failed miserably in Bosnia, put it that way. But the French needed a presence back in the country. And so he came back in to lead the French presence. And this is where he's mobbed at Pochentong. But if you look in the picture, the guy with the glasses back on the left, you might know him from, he did the most incredible book on Vietnam called Vietnam Inc. Philip Jones Griffiths, the Magnum photographer. The guy in the foreground is Stefan Ellis, who was, at that time, was with AFP. He committed suicide a year, two years after this. And there's another guy back here called Greg Davis, who also died of Agent Orange. So it's kind of a, a tribute picture to a lot of the mates, as well as, I suppose, this rather failed French general. The arrival in Battambang of the first Australians the Australians brought in six Black Hawk helicopters to try to infiltrate down into the, the, the Pylin corridor down Route 10. And so they brought in a number of logistics staff and, and, and people to deal with the issue. This is, this is Battambang. Having got all these 350,000 people in country from Thailand, how do you redistribute them? How do you get them back to where they think their home village is? I mean, everybody had been displaced. Nobody was in the same place where they'd started out their lives. And they decided the people who had come the furthest, which was Stung Treng, right up on the Lao border, to move them up river, up the Mekong, on three big river ferries. This is at the height of the monsoon, and it's the only time you can go up the Kong Rapids, which are, I mean, there's these incredible French river markers as you go up, the, up river, and it, you can only do about three or four knots upstream. The UN had meanwhile cantoned the Cambodian Navy, and these somewhat shonky aluminum boats were Russian the equivalent of the Russian apocalypse now, PBR boats, water jets. And they were queued, crewed by Kiwis, Brits, Filipinos, and Canadians. And Uruguayans, excuse me. And this is between, this is between Krache and uh, Stung Treng. And the, the dudes on the, on the prow of the, of the, the river ferries are Indonesian Marines. It was a real mix. I mean, it was incredible to, you could go out and have the most incredible sea ration feast from, you know, 23 countries of all kinds of very strange foods. The arrival of the, the ferries in Kampong Chum, where they lagered up overnight. In this neck of the woods, I mean, I, I say Siem Reap and the northwest, 
they put the Dutch Marines into a place called Tamarpuk, which was probably the only town where US aid had functioned cross border, feeding the BLDP and the Khmer Rouge. You could go into the market, the Khmer Rouge, the Royalists, the CPP, and the Neutralists were all had their own coffee shops, and you could literally drive around and take pictures of all these ferals having a great time in Tamarpuk. And the town was run by an Australian barrister called, who's a very good friend of ours, who's, who stepped in for a year and a half to run the city. I mean, it's not a city, it's a scrub, a scrub town. This is the trade, unfortunately, post-war, prostitution, animal parts, weapons, gems, have no frontier. And this is the traffic in, in Karachi of rare species, bits and bobs, I mean, I guess it must give somebody a hard-on somewhere. I don't know where, but it's, I mean, you grind, I don't know what you do with this stuff. But it's in the market in Karachi selling exotic animals parts. One thing that happened as soon as the UN moved in, and I'll give a little speech about this because to me it's the most important thing that happened. As the roads opened, commerce recommenced. With commerce recommencing, women were re-emancipated. Post-conflict, the easiest way to sort your country out is to re-emancipate womanhood in the country. And what happened was that the poor ladies had been working for nothing in the fields for you know, the 10 years of Vietnamese occupation, could suddenly travel, I don't care, 5, 10, 15 clicks down the street and make a profit off a few chilies or a few eggs and come back to their house with a shirt for the small one. But more importantly, the wife said to the husband, you don't get no nookie if you don't put your AK away. You watch it happening in Afghanistan, in Vietnam it was automatic because women are automatically more powerful or more liberated or more equal in Vietnam. Here, they were considered to be slightly untermensch and they suddenly had the ability to buy junk, I mean, stuff, and flog it at a small profit for a few real profit, enough to give a school pen, a t-shirt, a new kramar, something. And this power of women coming back into play in society was an incredible thing to watch as the roads opened I mean, up here you had Bengalis, you had French, you had Indians, in Batambang you had Malays. The boat from Sisyphon to the border was a Thai battalion of engineers building a road and smuggling all kinds of Thai rubbish. This is a Phnom Penh station, the trains to see in Utville before they stopped, they stopped running the trains about two years later. I'm a confessed smoker of the weed, and it was very good to see the weed coming back into sale. This is the market, the market in uh, Sierraville. Um, back then it was about seven cents a kilo, but that's, we're not going to get into that. The UN put the mockers on the best weed in the country. Before you lot got here, you could, go, you could go into virtually any cafe or restaurant and get an omelet or a soup with or without your ganja. I mean, the UN has just put the mockers on the whole thing. But I mean, they brought peace, but they didn't bring stonedness. The trouble was, there were nine million landmines minimum. I don't know how many thousands and thousands of tons of UXOs and UXBs. If you figure in the First World War, 50% of the ordnance, bombs, shells, mortars, all that shit, didn't go off. Belgium is still digging stuff up. If you think that America dropped 2.5 million tons of bombs on this country, I have no idea, no idea how many tons of mortars and shells. And you think that only 20% was left behind, you're still looking at 400,000 tons of explosives on top of the 9 million landmines. The first mob to come into this country and try to make a difference. There's a British organization called Halo, who are still here. And this was a little town 
south of Sisyphon called Monkle Barai. And there were two Brits and half a dozen Khmer trying to police up there. And this was a day, this was a day's reaping, I guess, harvest. It was also at the same time that the, the last Khmer Rouge offensive at Camp Bon Farm, which was the MSF hospital, there was an outbreak of typhoid as the last people were pushed out of the Khmer Rouge areas down onto the, the near the company stuff. This is way out west on the Thai border where uh, the people have been resettled, but, but a lot of them are getting the amputees coming out of hundreds of thousands at this point. It's a bit later in the piece, there was a, uh, a move by the ICRC, the International Committee of Red Cross in Russia, to, to stop the use of anti-personnel mines which is a little pub that was about this big, which cost two and a half, three bucks a pop. And we did a, a, a program where we spent days with different types of amputees and deep miners, based on the bat and bang, and sending the pictures live to Ottawa, the mining convention, the anti-mining convention, which is 96. The base of mine who, next American Marine, who I first met in Cuba putting legs on Faro Bando Marquis Salvadorio and to Boston. And he started the first clinic at King Clay, just after the Phnom Penh, the Vietnam veterans of America. And they've moved on from legs to, which cost 500 bucks a pop, to try and put hands on those who've lost their hands. And a hand tends to be between 5 and 10k, which is a bit, a bit expensive. Here it is the ICRC in back and back, teaching people to reuse their hands. And you've still got gonzos out there. They got a shopping bag of, of these Chinese made plastic mines, which at night they put out on the road, and in the morning they pick them up. And I said, so I called the MAG guys, the Mine Action Group people. I said, you better get down here and relieve these buggers of their, of their, of their toys, which they did a few, a couple of hours later. This is on the day of the elections, and the Dutch have been told, don't, uh, don't come out on the street with your, your automatic weapons. The Khmer Rouge came into town to vote. And they had threatened, a bit like in Afghanistan, everybody had a purple, a purple finger from the king, because the finger chopped off. The Khmer Rouge flocked in, registered, voted, and went home for the snow violence. And this is like a, and I like the fact these, these, these KR guys got brand new sneakers, I'm all I worry about is consumerism. I and mean, the great thing about the roads opening is they got new sneakers, new umbrellas, they were no longer Khmer Rouge, they were consumers. This is dodgy negotiations with a, a very smart British Marine. The, the, the Brits for them controlled the rivers and the lakes. And they put the Marines up in Krache as well as on the Tommy South. Um, this is a Khmer Rouge negotiating the, the rights to lumber and to do the, the logging rights in mean, Krache as you know, the centre of the you know, log stripping city. I mean, this country's now got bridges over all the rivers. Before there was a bridge at Kampong Chum, you had to take a ferry that took 40 minutes to cross. This is going across on Route 7 to get to the Vietnamese border to check it out. The Aussies were very smart during the UN, I mean, as my adopted nation, so I somehow got a trace of others. But what we did, we put in the, com the commons of communications here. We had a battalion of SAS signals, so they were very able-bodied dudes, to say the least. And they had a Canadian helicopter to move the engineers around. But the first thing they did was put in in Phnom Penh, where the old cathedral used to be, that's the station. The first massive great satellite dish thing. Before that, Cambodia had a dodgy landline system moved straight into the 20th, 21st century with mobile phones. 
and the Aussies put in relay six on all high points among the various borders of Vietnam and Japan and Thailand and Laos. And this is a little knot overlooking, overlooking Vietnam near Barbet. This is where your plane now taxes into park at, at Siemiat Airport. The Premier Rouge thought they would demonstrate they still had power possibility. They were still something to be reckoned with. And so they threw in half a dozen mortars one night. And nothing was, nobody was hurt. But it made the French, like in the first picture, big bunkers and filled sandbags everywhere around town. That's a Russian MI-18 helicopter if you're a famous one. These are Aussies out of, in the ironically out of vantage shrine, overseeing people coming into the election process and registering them. This is the day of voting, which was May the 21st, 93. Outside of the, the immediate, ameliorating role of the UN play in terms of setting up the elections, putting in infrastructure, they also ran a lot of medical emergencies. And this is on Kukong, and this lady had, I mean, I, I don't think she survived, but she had terminal cerebral malaria. Most of the UN casualties, I think there were 43 dead during the whole of the UN period, and 14 of those were from cerebral malaria. It used to be in the eastern zone of the country, there was malaria that she couldn't beat back, it was, it was rampant. And everybody was taking antibiotics as well, no sweat pills, uh, which made you feel really lousy. This lady was, was brought from the Philippines back to the, the sea of the people. This is a patrol with the UN with the, key, the Kiwis left in the front of the south. I took the picture because actually the gun is on a kid's gun on a floating hip and it's um, Maybe it's called photo art, I don't know. These are Aussies at a little checkpoint right close to the edge of the corner, making sure the plumber is in there. And if you're a gun spotter, that's a Steyr, which is our assault weapon in Australia. We've actually got an improved one now. This is a patrol in Baton Bank of the, the CPP, the local militia. You will recognize what an RPG is. I mean, I don't quite know what the police force was doing with blocking the Belgian things. There's not going to be a question of these things. This is Casino City now. This is Barbet out on the Vietnamese border. Before we put, they put the casino in. And this is an Aussie that up at the border for this is a police patrol in the middle of Baton Bang in the monsoon, so this must have been, this must have been late May. This was the officially the last violence created by the Khmer Rouge. It wasn't actually a Khmer Rouge shooting. This was a bit of a Funson Peck, the Royalist Village Chief, in a town which is about 40 clips west of here from Book. And we were Staying at the, the battles, which was run down about five years earlier about this murder. And we drove out there myself and Greg Davis. And we found this village chief who is a royalist and officially he committed suicide by shooting himself in the back with an AK six time. Um, they still haven't made out the helicopter. I don't quite know who these, this mob was. I mean, the whole country in the early 90s, the Russian market in Phnom Penh, you could buy an AK for about nine bucks, a grenade for two dollars. It was just swimming with weapons. And you didn't quite know who on the roads controlled what checkpoint. I mean, the, when you drove to Baton Bank in Phnom Penh, it would take you, you'd drive to Kusak, and then you'd drive to Baton Bank the next day. And the feral troops, would control the bridge points and they'd take the planks up and you'd be in a taxi and they'd lean into the taxi cab with a grenade with a pin out. All they wanted was cigarettes, so you kept a part of the cigarettes in the dashboard and handed out the cigarettes. And then they put the planks back on the bridge and you drove on. So this mob, government, 
making government way be like that. I heard that very early in the morning. The UN also opened up the prisons. And for the first time, I suspect, Cambodian prisoners got, let's say, human rights, got a, got a glimpse of the fact they were human. And this was Women's Day, uh, T3, the main prison down that front end. Very, very good. You all have a really grim experience for the G3. The Australians and other forces imported these strange things from South Africa from buffaloes, which you see from the shape of the hull is designed to hit an empty tank mine and hopefully survive. And this is the streets in Battle Bank, which the German GI said uh, aid mission is now trying to stick up and put back into you know, the better pot look. The top marine and the dodgy British vehicle, you know, I can say about that. This is the tomato. Just like in Vietnam, we had a five o'clock follies briefing every day at Untak headquarters, which was known uh, the city of Phnom Penh. And unfortunately for the UN spokesman, his name was Eric Fox. So it became faulty towers. <laughs> and this, I mean, I'm not saying it was a disinformation package, they were actually quite honest. They wanted the mission to be propagated. This is, this is five o'clock five in front of them. This is the UN team in Crackship. Uh, Kiwis, Brits, Canadians, a Filipino Maso and a Filipino dentist. Uh, and they control the area all the way across the Vietnamese border in Menot and Sun and up to Sun This is the Cambodian army about to repel the Khmer Rouge north of Kampong Tom. I don't know what they're going to do with the Chuk. Maybe the Chuk was a low level kind of drone. But, I mean, they hadn't got the remote control for the Chuk, but the, this is the Cambodian army off to war. Joys, that's 50 kilos of marijuana, folks. That's 50 keys of pure. And when I saw those 50 keys, I went over and I said, oh, come inside. Oh, yeah, yeah. So he took a great big handful of this stuff and made me eat it. Have you ever tried to eat a hand? I mean, it's like a buffalo munching on you know, dry weed. I stood there, I'm trying to eat like a handful of dry, and it's very good weed. And then they gave me I might, something about this big fool. They said, but this is in Phnom Penh market. But the UN mocked this out. This is, this is, I mean, if you're going to have a United Nations, we've got to have legalized Colorado weed, in my opinion, story. It was weird because when peace started to come, the Sangha, the Buddhist community, obviously the monks had no money. The Watts were in disrepair, they'd been used as prisons, they'd been used as ammo dumps. And so the monks got, I'm trying to think of the right way of putting it, were allowed by the Sangha, by the ruling body of the, the Buddhist clergy, to actually work, I mean, to, to do physical labor, as opposed to sit around meditating. And this is up on the banks of the Mekong, at a place called Rokok Noor, right, a long way north of Kampong Chum, and the river takes a right hand. And they were rebuilding the water. There's this bamboo for the scaffolding on the, on the new water. That's Phnom Penh back in 92. And right after this, the whole of the riverfront became squatter set central. It was nothing but refugees who were in the last offensives. And there was nothing the other side of the river. The bridge hadn't been rebuilt at this point. And then in the middle of Phnom Penh, somebody's got their own sacks out. And there is normal sea. I mean, almost as good as Cuba, not quite. They were going to introduce tractor racing, three-wheel tractor racing in Cambodia, but they only had one competitor, so it, this is the only, only tractor in the race from Baton Bank to Bursa. I like his body English, though. He's got the whole thing figured out. Please don't ask. I have a penchant for photographing weird signs and graffiti. Don't, I have no idea what they're talking about. 
If anybody's got a clue, please write it on a slip of paper and I'll accept. They say that the Aussies were very smart and brought in this massive great satellite dish and Cambodia moved straight from the landline instantly to mobile phones and a few landlines. This was the first landline they put in near the central market. But nobody knew how to use it. And they also moved straight into DVDs. They went straight past CDs. They went straight to, I mean, really expensive looking DVD players. Silly question. What's she doing with a gun? It's a very simple story. Her dad forgot his gun on his way to work. He was stationed in a bunker up the street in Parai, south of Camp Tom. And we, I was with a guy from the Daily Express who was a, basically a paparazzi. He saw this girl, he got out of the truck, and he had three Nikons with flash. Chuka chuka chuka, he's a paparazzi. Chuka 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 chuka. And she was completely stunned, befuddled by this kind of paparazzi from London. I got out and made two pictures of the Leica. And I suppose, I mean, her dad got his gun and his lunch. And I mean, it's not a child soldier story, although people have now misconstrued it as being a child soldier. Her dad had just left the gun at home. But the reason was Cambodia, why don't you need a gun? This is an airline you don't book a seat on. This is Korea Airline, North Korean Aleutian, which brought Snooky, sorry, King Sienu, back the first time from exile in Poignang and they put out the red carpet for him. And he was almost mobbed and overrun. And they left the plane out there. I guess nobody's going to steal a North Korean revolution. This is when he came back the second time and the Thais gave him a 63 white Cadillac to come downtown in. And this is as he's deplaning and getting into his caddy at the airport. The crowds when the king came home were quite phenomenal. And this was on the way back in from Pochentung to downtown. As you well know, the election was it was pretty fair and square. Yeah, there were infractions, there were irregularities. Immediately after the election, Hun Sen usurped the I mean he lost by three or four percent to to Ranarit, uh, son, Prince Ranarit. And this is Ranarit with a very young Sam Ramsey at the Funsipek headquarters in central Phnom Penh, accepting winning, except he, did, he won to lose. Because within months, the CPP and the Hunster had taken over and basically almost exiled Ranarit. It was, it was a debacle at the end of the day. This is the Hunster with Honey Bunny off to vote in Tatmal, a uh, pagoda in uh, the Wat in Tatmal. These are Sam Ramsey supporters on the Vietnamese border near Kampong Truck. You're all bored with this picture. This, this, is, this is my retirement program. This is my super anno, as we call it in Australia. I shot four frames in 10 seconds. It was the first time that they allowed the opposition, the CPP obviously were canvassing and polling right around the country. Ranaret and the op other opposing parties had no way of getting about. I mean, the roads were insecure, there was, the roads were absolute shite at that time. And so the UN gave Baby Snooki a uh, uh, Bell 212 to go and do his hustings. And I'd been flying with the pilot, with the Aussies, for days before. And the chopper was supposed to fly out of the football stadium this way. And the pilot gave me a signal and said, watch this. And he put the nose down and went straight at the crowd and then lifted up. And, it and I never saw the film. It went back to the UK for The Guardian. And two weeks later, somebody turned up in Phnom Penh and I got this two-page spread in The Guardian, Life magazine, and it's going to chunk, 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 chunk in the till, it was like. And it's still going to chunk. And you can buy this print. We have spare prints to buy, but you have to talk to my better half, who is, I can't locate her at the moment, but if you go and talk to my better half, Mao, she can arrange a print sale for you. 
I gotta put a strike in somewhere. There's an election rally in outside the, the National Museum in Phnom Penh, one of the last rallies for before they voted on the, the 21st of May 93. Again another of the last election rallies. This time it was a seal with a runner in the election campaign. Simultaneously, the, the Sangha put on, with kind of strange white folk who turned up in robes, I mean, not quite Hare Krishnas, but it was Buddhist, white folk Buddhist, round eyed Buddhists turned up. And there were peace marches from Udong into the city, from the Vietnamese borders of the city, from the Lao borders of the Phnom Penh. And this was a, a march which had arrived at Wat Tom in Phnom Penh. As you well know, traditionally in Cambodia to raise money for the Wats, people dress up like giant puppets and wear masks and stop the traffic and beg for small change. To, and this was like, on, this is a place called Pik Nil. If you drive down towards Sihanoukko and you go to that area which the Khmer Rouge used to control over the pass. And they were stopping people to get money for them to rebuild their Wat. This is a picture of a winner. Well, I don't know about a winner, but he was supposed to be the prime minister, but it didn't happen. This is at the acceptance of victory. No comment. No comment. One-eyed bandit. I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to talk any more about this issue. This is the last rally right in front of the royal palace in Phnom Penh before the, the, the election closed. This is the Khmer Rouge going home into Marcouk. They tried to stop everybody voting. In the end, the people flocked into Marcouk to vote, and they were going back out to the minefields in the northwest out in Banti Minchai. There's a vote being posted in a, a, the, the old royal capital of Udong, 50 kilometers from Phnom Penh. That was your ballot form, if you were. It was the first time that monks had been allowed to vote as well, so it was... And they hadn't had a free and fair election ever. And suddenly this, this swath of democracy did come to Cambodia. The roads opened, women emancipated, and in all honesty, you wouldn't be here if the UN hadn't come into this country. I mean, I'm... I'm not trying to prophetize the UN, but it's the only thing we've got. Maybe it's the only way we can make progress by supporting the UN. I mean, I don't know any other solution at this juncture in our time. These are monks coming in to vote at Tamar Puk through a minefield. I mean, the whole country was covered in red and white tape and mine signs at that point. These are people queuing up to vote in Phnom Penh. I can't remember which polling station. These are the results which, I mean, at that time the television and, and news services were rather shonky. And so they posted, right opposite where the cantina used to be in Phnom Penh, they posted the election results right along the front there. And this was the, as they came in, they were scribbling the results up. This is just another pretty picture. I shouldn't have put this in, really. But, I mean, it can look very beautiful, and I, I, mean, I actually like the monsoon season. I mean, this is behind you, probably know that if you go out the back of the FCC in Phnom Penh, and you sit out on the balcony, that's, there's the, the National Museum. I'm now coming into a little personal part of the tribute to some friends in the long words. There used to be a bar just, on, just up the street here called the Minefield, which was full of souvenir ordnance and explosives run by a Kiwi. Unfortunately, he had a predilection to small children and he's now doing 30 years. But this was the minefield bar, which was, was the Untak bar back then. We had a great place in Phnom Penh, which the man who started this FCC, Anthony Alderson, ran a thing called the No Problem, which was the the best cafe and restaurant in Phnom Penh at the time. It's graffiti and notices inside the cantina bar. What, you, what was up for sale? 
This was another place which was opposite there, with no problem. This was, the, at one point he was the Reuters man uh, and worked for German news service, Leo Dobbs. He's now a UN spokesman in Geneva, so. A photographer who started the agency called Seven, a guy called Gary Knight, which Jim Natchway and a lot of other people belong to, Christopher uh, Morris and stuff. Stefan Ellis, who was the Argence France Press main snapper. He was a bit deluded, he caught malaria, he became a junkie. Went home to the States on the 4th of July, went home to his father's place in Pennsylvania and committed suicide with a shotgun. This is in a, a house of ill repute in Sienukville, getting refreshed when we drove down to do a piece on the emerging Cambodian Navy. Freelance photographer called Serge Corrieras, who worked a lot for Reuters. And when the French paramarines came in, they offered us all like a three-day experience with them. And part of it was to go out and I don't know any photographers who don't like to pop caps and fire guns, and it's part of that whole mystique, I suppose. And this is out in the range with the, uh, with the French paramarines. You've all heard of Al Rockoff. I mean, he was uh, the, the, the man who fixed the passports in the killing fields. And this is actually, this is in Pat Pong in Bangkok, but off duty, shall we say. Al was also very peculiarly a herpetologist. He was a snake expert. And we were waiting for Snooky to come back out of Pochentong. And Al dived in the monsoon dish, ditch and came up with this black, mean looking snake. And we all scattered. And then he picked the snake up and he wound it up like a, like a, like one of those whiz bang things, like he was going to throw a, a, a hammer. Some of you might know this, maybe the best book, one of the best books written on this country is called River of Time. And the author is a, a man called John Swain, who also features in the killing fields. And this is John coming down the, the steps of the FCC in Phnom Penh. Close up of Swain. Boy Swain, as I call him. My very good friend, Philip Jones Griffiths. This when it, when all the various people were coming into Pochentong, various UN troops. I think this is the arrival of the Philippine Marines. This is Philip out at the same place as the, um, I took the famous helicopter picture in Craig Bang. Philip died of Agent Orange cancer of the throat. Greg Davis, who was also here for a long time, was in Vietnam as well, died of cancer of the liver in two months. And the gentleman on the right is Tetsiano Tetsini, who wrote an incredible book, A Fortune, told, a Fortune Teller Told Me. He covered the whole of the elections without ever leaving the ground. The Fortune Teller told him only travel by bus, plane, bus, train or boat. And he covered the whole of the elections without going in the air. This is Francois Bizot, the, that incredible book called The Gate. This is his daughter who was born in captivity with the Khmer Rouge. And she was here, she'd been a catwalk model and she came here to, to work as a photographer. This is the guy who wrote, William Shawcross, who wrote, which is probably one of the best books about the Cambodian conflict. This is the guy who started the VVA clinic, uh, Ron Ostrov, in King Kleng, just the other side of the river from Phnom Penh. Probably the most erudite writer for the Times who was here, a guy called Jimmy Pringle. And he still has a flat in Phnom Penh, but he lives in Bangkok most of the time. This is Charlie Twining, the first American ambassador. He's just smoked a joint this big, <laughs> made of recycled Khmer Rouge one-time code papers from Q Sam Pan's house. And we were walking around Anchor with the UNICEF chief, deciding on how to spend millions. And I gave him this big flaming torch. And I mean, it proves diplomacy can be made to work. Again, this is out of Pachentong. Richard Vogel of Reuters, uh, Al Rockoff. Take a bow. This is the Reuters bureau chief, Mark Dodd. He's in the room. I don't know where. This is Mark Dodd. 
our, our bar of doom was a place called the Gecko Bar. This is obviously our man over here. And this is the, the poor individual, Dave Walker, whose body was, he, he left his Seamriat house and disappeared. And his body was found a month later near the west gate of Anchor. And it's still a mystery. You've probably heard of Nate Thayer, the man who found Pol Pot. This is Nate Thayer on the first day. We missed the first day of the elections because I had concocted 15 gallon laughing chicken soup on the roof of the Phnom Penh Post. AP, Reuters, Agence France Press were all incapacitated by the chicken soup. And so the first day of the election wasn't covered at all. And this is when we finally got to the National Stadium. This is Nate Thayer when he had a. This is our old A team. I shouldn't. This is at the back end of the Royale and the bungalows. This is Nate Thayer with Greg Davis. Nate smoking substance. And this is when he put on a different. He was starting to work for the government again. He should be here. The man who started the first paper in this country, the Phnom Penh Post, Michael Hayes. This is at the election results opposite the Royal Palace in Phnom Penh with the day's paper. This is on the last offensive towards Pai Lin, just after the elections. This is Nate's possessions. You notice Xanax, a code of ethics book, a pistol, everything a man needs to do a good reporting job. We're now moving to 94, which is the last little bit of fun here. Nate put together an expedition to try to find the Cambodian national animal, the Kupre which is a dew lapped cow, reputed to still be half a dozen of them, living on the Mongolkiri, Ratnakiri border in the middle of nowhere, former Khmer Rouge territory. This is when we set off from Sen Monorong, and the expedition was funded by Soldier of Fortune magazine, which I think Bob Brown, this former Special Forces guy, wanted to kill the coup prey because he had a 375 Magnum with him. And this is setting off in the truck to go up the Ho Chi Minh Trail to find this bloody cow. Then we got six elephants, which we stuck Phnom Penh post stickers on. We had more guns than we had cents. Michael had an umbrella. Everybody else had an AK or a, a Max 49. Was, we had more weapons than I've ever seen in my life. This is, this is one of our, unquote, our helpers, our security. These were two elephant drivers we had. This is not how to carry your M16. This is not the way to go to war. This is not the way to be a guard on a Kupri expedition. I'm doing a book eventually about Cambodia just called The Middle Distance. If you ever notice Cambodians and they're sitting there, what are they really looking at? It's the middle distance. It's pure Zen focus on the middle distance. The expedition setting off, we had no water cans, so we all collapsed from heat prostration on the second day. This is Bob Brown and his mercenary. The, the guy who was his bodyguard behind there had been a machine gunner in Vietnam. And the job he'd had just before he arrived for this job was a counter sniper sniper in Croatia. And he ended up with his head on a stake in Sierra Leone working for Executive Outcome, the uh, South African mercenary organization. I got 500 bucks for that last picture to go on the Soldier of Fortune. I mean, to get given 500 bucks on the Ho Chi Minh Trail to take a picture of two Lulus was just... Michael only had a pink umbrella, so we would say, this is the remains of an American phantom shot down on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. There was no water except this one miserable little pond. And Nate had this brilliant idea, because of the threat of tigers, we all had to wear masks. Hello? I mean, in the Sundarbans of Bengal, you put the mask on your back of your head, because tigers don't attract you from the front. They come from behind and like rip your guts out. So we're all walking around with Mrs. Thatcher and John Major. That was Nate, Miss Piggy. That was Kerman Kitt, who's now UNDP chief. I brought that from England. Warren Christopher, 
I know that's a dim recollection. Nate with Donald Duck and Michael. This is planning the route to find the Coupre. The whole area was just covered in bomb, bomb craters from the war. And then the Khmer Rouge found us, so we had to kind of do a, an evacuation. This is the base camp, which was a Khmer Rouge, former Khmer Rouge base camp. I was evacuated with heat prostration after eight days. And these are the two pilots, French pilots, who evacuated us. Problem was, their Porta Palacios tried to take off at 2.30 in the afternoon when there was no lift. They had been drinking wine at lunch with Cook. They were pissed out of their skulls. They tried to take off in the middle of the day, overloaded. Have you ever done a U-turn in an aeroplane? At the end of St. Monorom Strip? I mean, put the brakes on. One wing touched the ground in the U-turn. And this is when we arrived back in Phnom Penh. Well, this is the final picture. I know you're relieved after all this nonsense. Just south of school, on the road to, to where you come from, Kampong Cham and Kampong Tom, the area from the crossing point at Udong up to there was the worst fought over part of this country possibly. And in 1991, early 92, the Khmer army moved in and cleared the UXOs, cleared the UXBs and sold off prime territory to members of the armed forces. It was the first of the land grabs. And this was a local captain's, I guess it was a, I'm not a car buff, but I guess it was a Corolla imported from Japan, covered in a flag in this, in this resurrected bomb-free area, which is now, this is just near where you, you buy your spiders, your fried spiders, here where the bus stops on the way up to up and down to Chimriat. To, to End of story, 1993. I mean, it could be continued, but 